think everybody loves the Kobe. I think everybody wants to be number one. I think everybody wants to be praised. I think everybody wants to be recognized. I think everybody wants to be treated VIP royal. Nobody says I want a crappy house, a crappy spouse, a, a crappy bank account. Nobody, everybody wants the best in life. So that in itself says you're competitive. Competition is great. I think that competition makes us better. The integrity is the, the core of free enterprise. Money controls you, where you live, where you eat, when you get to vacation, what you get to do, what you can't do. But, but most people don't ever learn how to lose, so they never learn how to really compete. So would you like to have a conversation, fireside chat with a couple first generation cash flow millionaires with my buddies right here? Stay tuned to this episode of Seven Fears Quite Happening. Three, two, one, let's go. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jeter. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from the La Cantera Resort here in San Antonio, Texas. Here with my buddies here, Cash Flow Millionaire, inductees to the Seven Figure Squad. What's going on, guys? So, all right, gentlemen, I appreciate you taking some time here while we're at our million dollar round table retreat here in San Antonio, Texas. Kind of cool, though, that we were supposed to be in Lake Tahoe, and then we had to make a pivot. I was not really looking forward to Lake Tahoe. Anyway. <laughs> Truth be told, I didn't want to go from 30 degree weather to 30 degree weather, but I heard that the Kardashians rented it out, the lodge that we were about to stay at two weeks ago uh, as we're going to sell. So, anyway, are you guys glad here that you're in San Antonio? Yes, we're excited to be here. Um, we, have a, we have this meeting, we do once a year, right? And, uh, and uh, we teach people how to run a seven-figure business. And we're excited. We're excited because you, you, you run it super fast. You started making millions of dollars in, in our business and the same with you, George. And um, we're excited to be here. We cannot wait. Uh, we have this plan for 2021 to how many people. You know, that's the proof, right? We train and then we see if these people, they can go and run seven figures in their business. So it's gonna be very exciting. We, set, we started off five years ago with zero. Uh, we started off with 27 people. I mean, look at the, look at the crowd we have here today and f fired up about it. Okay, so last night we watched the Atlas Shrugged documentary and the prophecy, which got me thinking because I remember growing up and all of us, we didn't go through money. I mean, Rodolfo, you're an immigrant from El Salvador, uh, uh, economics degree and, and worked as a Security, security guard in America. <laughs> yes, when I, when I came, yes. When I, I, I went to school in El Salvador, immigrated to the U.S. in, in about two, 2006, I came and I uh, found a job. I uh, was working as a security guard at the mall and uh, last prevention. And uh, yeah, and I thought that was my future. I thought that was what I was gonna be doing my entire life. And uh, I got the chance to meet a mentor. I had the chance to get into the right industry. My life completely changed. But that's my background. Immigrant from El Salvador, uh, didn't speak the language, didn't speak English, and uh, was working as a security guard at the mall. So not raised with money? I'm sorry? Not raised with money? No, raised with money. I grew up, uh, I, I, I don't think that I grew up in a, in a place where we never have food. We have food, we have a place to sleep, we have a good, my parents, they were good people, they always have the, send me to great schools. And, but there was never like, a, there was never this, one day we're gonna have that. One day, I remember seeing one day, I see this Corvette, there was this Corvette in El Salvador. And I said, one day I'm gonna have that car. And I loved it. Yeah. And everybody, no, 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 you cannot have a car like that. That's only for rich people. I used to have this um, Lamborghini and toy, right? And uh, I used to play with this Lamborghini. I was like 10 years old and I used to play eight years old and I used to play with this Lamborghini. I say, one day I'm gonna have a car like this. Yeah. Say no. Only crooks, only, only bad people have cars like this. So I grew up with this uh, mindset. There is two mindsets. There is a broke mindset, the poor mindset. I think I have both. And I was broke and I was poor. And, and, and a lot of things changed through um, this um, environment. You know, this environment, this capitalistic entrepreneurship environment, a lot of things changed when I came. Uh, what about your situation, George? Thank you, Rudolfo. George, your situation too. You know, olive, or not Olive Garden, sorry. I was an Olive Garden, sorry. You were a Red Lobster. A, a Red Lobster. Still a, uh, with the Darden. Darden restaurant, right? Yes. <laughs> You're my cousin, cousin uh, server. I was a host at Olive Garden, so I would bring him to your table. <laughs> so so we would, uh, we would uh, get paid from the same corporation, though. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, Friday. <laughs> so your, your upbringing, you know, you, you weren't raised with money, your, your thought process with money. You know, to, to Rudolfo's point, what was your thoughts early on in your life about rich people? 
You know, when my grandmother, she's from Cuba, it takes one person to change a, uh, a whole family's life. Um, didn't come for money, started a business, started sewing, and uh, built a factory. And that was the first taste of money that my family got. Uh, from there, we had a swap meet business. And my parents knew how to work hard. Um, very hardworking people, two different companies. Dad had a job, so it was a hardworking family. A lot of money was made. Um, but there wasn't a consciousness of what to do with money afterwards. There wasn't an idea of how to really run a business besides working hard, how to scale a business, how to go through ups and downs of a business. And so um, at one point when the economy crashed, a lot of people don't know how to rebound from, from a crash in their life. And my family never rebounded from that. Uh, they ended up doing what's the safest thing to do, which is when you got little kids and you got no money and you don't know what's going on with the economy, you go get a job and just to put food on the table. And, uh, and then after that, you know, jobs just don't pay enough today. Um, they just struggle. We struggled as a family. Always, always had food, always great family. They worked their butts off to give us everything we needed. Uh, but there wasn't, you know, the fights were over money. The arguments were over money. And if it wasn't money related, it was because of the stress of a lack of money. Uh, where they went every day. We have to leave. Why? Because we got to go to our jobs. Why? Because we have to go make money. So schedule when i looked at money i was like man money controls you where you live where you eat when you get to vacation what you get to do what you can't do you know uh all of that was controlled by money so i actually i actually was super uh, uh frustrated about that and i was like there's no way in the world i can go work a job because i'm looking at what this job is doing to my family it's never going to give us enough ever so here's my dreams Here's, here's the income of a job. And I'm like, these things, I gotta, I gotta let go of all my dreams yeah. to go do this job. Um, or I gotta have a, a, an entrepreneur mentality. And that's when I was exposed to entrepreneurship. We're at a resort that's this, uh, it's a private hotel on the seventh floor. You gotta get a security, uh, private check-in on the seventh floor. Then you walk <laughs> in, private bar. Pri like you're thinking the only restaurants down here are the bars yeah. and the, no. and you go upstairs and it's like, there's a whole other world, you yeah. know? And I was always wondering, like, what the hell do those people do? Like, what do I got to do to get on that elevator? What do I got to do to live in that house? What do I got to do to drive that car? Yeah. You know, and um, what do I got to do to have that life? And it's just not taught. Nobody's teaching it. And so your channel, you know, yeah. Seven Figure Squad, like for somebody like me wanting to go make a million dollars, I was looking for people that were already making a million dollars, not people talking about it, but people making it that could really teach me. And I think what you're producing for people can change people's lives. So... I appreciate it, George. Yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Well, listen, the common denominator that we've already established here, this conversation starting, is that all of us come from nothing. Zero, scratch. Some harder than others. The unique thing about this, another common denominator, is we're all making our millions in the financial services, the insurance industry. A very wealthy industry that has not been affected by the pandemic or the lockdowns, shutdowns. The other common denominator between the three of us is that we all made our millions different ways. Same industry, but you know, different uh, uh, styles and different ways, even though we're using the same industry, the uh, same platform. So what separates, I think, uh, uh, Rodolfo from us between a lot of other firms is that when, when I first came in here, you, you, uh, you hosted a first uh, uh, um, leadership meeting when I was at a convention. You know, we call that internally, we call that a President's Club meeting, right? And uh, you asked me, uh, when I took too much time, didn't know why you were walking on stage. <laughs> Basically, it cut me off because I didn't know what the timing was. You asked me before we stepped off stage, who are you competing with this year? I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? Like, who, who, who are you calling out? I'm like, I'm calling out George. I'm, who are the top guys? George, the top guy, and right? I'm calling the top guys. Why wouldn't I want to compete? But for a lot of people, Rodolfo, they're afraid with that question. They're afraid with competition. Can, can you share with everybody here why they should compete, why it's healthy for you to want to compete, even though it's natural for us, but why, why is it healthy for us to compete? Yeah, I, uh, competition is great. I think that competition makes us better. Um, th th there are some times, um, you know, I went to this school in, in El Salvador. I went to this school, and I remember going, and in, my, in the schools in El Salvador, you know, when you come to over here in a private school, you, there are 10 students, 15 students, right? Over there, there are 50 students. And there are, there are five different, you know, you're going to fifth grade, there are fi five different sections, you know, and each of them is 50 students. Wow. Five and zero, 50. Five zero, no wow. 15, five zero, 50. And sometimes because my last name is Vargas, I always be 45. 
46. At the end. 43. At the end. At the end. Okay. Correct. This is based on the last name. <clears throat> and I remember, since I was like in third grade, fourth grade, this is all the time. At the end of the week, I used to have these teachers. They used to come. They would rank you from one to the 50th. Yeah. Number one. The number one over here in the class. Ta -la -la. Number two. Ta -la -la. And, and it's exciting, right? And sometimes they started from the 50th. Number 50. Imagine you're number 50 <laughs> <laughs> in the class. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I remember I wanted to fight to be at the top. That was important since I was a kid. And I, and, and I, see all, and I, and I remember seeing other kids. They were number 40, 42nd, number 41. And, and I, there was this school that they was ranking all the time. Then I just started swimming. And in swimming, there was a ranking. And they used to rank you. And you always wanted to, when you're swimming, you always want to rank high. Because if you rank high, you're in the middle lane. Right. If you're in the middle. And less weak. Less, correct. You're less friction. Less, less yeah. friction in the yeah. water. So you always wanted to compete and be in the best ranking so you can be in the best lane. Um, so since I was a kid, there was always a competition. I remember my dad, uh, we were swimming. And he used to beat me, right? He used to beat me all the time. My dad was also a swimmer. He used to beat me all the time. And one day I beat him. Oh. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and I beat him. And I was, I was proud, right? Hey, I beat you, right? I beat, I beat my dad. I was pro probably like 11 years old, 10 years old. And I was, I was a really good swimmer, like to beat an adult. And my dad told me one day, he says, son, listen, son, you beat me. That's great. Don't celebrate too much because... You're not supposed to do that, right? Like I was making fun of, hey, I beat you, I beat you. But he says something that I remember until now. I loved it. He says, if you beat me, you really beat me. You know how parents, they let their kids win? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they can increase yeah. their self-esteem? Yeah. So my dad never let me win until I legit, right. I beat him. So for me it was, man, I beat my dad. I was 10 years old, 11 years old. I'm really good. I'm beating my dad. And he never faked it. Then we used to play chess, right? And, um, and he used to beat me until I beat him. And he told me, if you beat me, you beat me good. So that increases self-esteem. So what am, I, what am I telling you with competition? I believe competition is great. Competition makes you better. Yeah. I wanted to swim better because I was competing with my dad. I wanted to be ranking at the top because over there in El Salvador, if you're ranking at the top, you get to carry the flag. You know, you're military, right? Yeah. You get to carry sure. the flag yeah. Yeah. like yeah, this, right, right, right? right? And you wanted to be the number one guy, so the number one guy carries a flag at the Independence Day. Was that important? Um, I think so, because I used to study more. I wanted to compete. I wanted to be in the middle lane so I can uh, be swim faster. Competition makes you better. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, sometimes we see this competition as a bad connotation. You're competitive. You're combative. You're this. You, that is the case if the person is not improving or if the person is um, uh, taking advantage of the system. That, I will tell you, is negative. But competition, improving, getting better, telling somebody, you know what, I'm going to beat you. Like, like we're competing in that company. Yeah. You know, if you beat me, you beat me, great. But if you don't, man, you know how we compete? Hey, let me see who makes more money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What a great competition, right? Yeah. The more money you make, the more money we compete, the more we help our family, the more clients we have, the more people we help with policies. What a great competition. Yeah, sure. is, so for me, competition is the, is, is the values, is the, is the integrity, is the, the core of free enterprise. This is coming from a guy that just won a competition internally with inside a company, and he won a kilo of gold. It's gonna be, you, you, ever, you got a safe already for the kilo of gold that you're going to be putting? I had to. I had to. <laughs> I had this safe. Imagine a kilo of gold. What yeah. a, man, what a genius <laughs> competition, right? It's about, worth about $60,000 a kilo of gold. You know, people think it's the gold. Let me, let me give you this. It might be the gold, might not be the gold. Sometimes it's not the gold. It's not the $60,000 price. Sometimes it's $6 price. Yeah. You know, it's, let's compete to see who wins the $6. It's the excite, excitement of... Uh, Improving, competing, wanting to, let me see who loses the most weight. Let me see who's the faster. That's exciting. Speaking of that, George, you know, you, you uh, are Puerto Rican, you're Cuban, El Salvadorian. Sometimes people think compete. People think street. People think I got to take you out. I'm taking you out. You know, you get hood with it. You know what I mean? But 
how do I tr how do I how do you transfer that from being thuggish about it, being hood about it, to being mature about it, being adult about it, by improving and discovering the next best version of you by competing? You play Rodolfo in chess. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've played in chess like forty times. I beat him one time, man. Is that good? Yeah. We played. But when I beat him. I beat him. <laughs> <laughs> he did. One time, after did. we finished that, I was like, yeah, Rolf, I got to go. I got to go. He <laughs> beat me. And he gave me like a three, a glass of wine. Uh, <laughs> that I don't remember. Throughout the decision-making process. <laughs> no, but um, from combative competition to, you know, mature competition, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with how people are raised in the environment of competition when they lose, you know? So... You know, in school, as a kid, somebody loses a fight. What do people do? They make fun of you, right? And typically, that's like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot of shame. Uh, you got your puppy, you lost, ah, embarrassment, right? A lot of embarrassment to losing. Um, if you grow up in like a sport and you got the right coach and somebody can help you process losing, because that's the reason I don't think, I, I think everybody loves to compete. I think everybody wants to be number one. I think everybody wants to be praised. I think everybody wants to be recognized. I think everybody wants to be treated VIP, royal, royal. Sure. You know, nobody says I want a crappy house, a crappy spouse, a, ca a crappy bank account. Nobody, everybody wants the best in life. So that in itself says you're competitive. But, oh, wow. Good but, point. But, but, but most people don't ever learn how to lose. So they never learn how to really compete. Right. And, and they, they, they take it personal. You know, they're embarrassed and all that. And so I think if, if there was an environment where people learned, you know, that losses, uh, they say you can win or you can lose, right? In, in our business, we say you can win or you can learn. And uh, so I think every single loss allows you, if you look at that and say, okay, did I prepare? Did I practice? What could I have done more? Man, I could have got more mentorship. I could have got more coaching. I could have worked harder. I could have done this. I think losses teach you, um, a lot about how to get better. And you wanna compete with people that are better than you because that makes, that brings out the, the, the bigger version. And at the end of the day, if you do more than what you would have done prior, mm -hmm. you're winning. And I think when you look at, when you look at competition that way, like everybody's winning, it changes it from it being a combative thing. You know, sometimes people think, like I was watching an interview the other day with Charlie Kirk, and he says, you think that um, to make people uh, just because somebody's rich, somebody's poor. And he was like, just because the concept of somebody being rich, that because one person's rich doesn't mean this person's poor, you know? Wow. And there's typically that, that, that conversation. And so today there's a lot of arguments on, uh, you know, people that make a lot of money are bad or people that make a lot of money, all they care about is money, you know? And, and it's like, nobody knows behind the scenes, you know, what we do with our money, how much money you give this, like, to church, to charities, to this and like, you know, um, we couldn't do those things if we weren't working and winning and competing. And um, you guys make me better constantly. Uh, this whole event is all about competition, sizing people up. But it's not like as much as we're competing, there's like we still wear the same jersey. We want to see each other win. And it's not a, a win lose. Like I'm, I'm better than you. It's like, man, I wanted it more. Man, you wanted it. OK, cool. I'm going to get better. And you go again. And it's not final. Um, so it's just a different mindset on, on, on how I, I look at it. But I've learned that by being around guys like you. I've learned that by being around Patrick, by being in this environment. And when I lost, right, learning how to take that as a lesson on how I could get better and making progress. Um, it's never final, you know, a yeah. loss is never final. You can always rebound and get better from it, so. As I wrap up, man, my final question to you guys. Rodolfo, somebody out there, what, what guidance would, somebody's watching this right now, they're not a millionaire yet. How do I compete like a millionaire and how do I embrace failure like a millionaire? What would you say to that? You know, George, just say something very important about, about, the lo about losing. So somebody sees somebody making, making it in business or making it in their life or making it whatever in sports. What is interesting is that person have lost more times than one. You know, yeah. it, it, that person is not that. You think that that person is a winner. No, that person just lost more times. You know, and, and, and um, what if we were to learn how to lose? Like George says something very important. He says, don't take it personal, meaning, um, okay, I lost. Let's just say, right? I lost a sale. I lost a competition. 
allies is something. You know what it's telling you? Okay, you need to improve. You need to get better. Mm -hmm. The other guy was better prepared. The other guy has better strategies. Yeah. You know, for, for us, why, why? I, I think that uh, why, and I don't want to sound like, oh my gosh, these guys are killing it. It's, it's great, you know, you have a net income of seven figures, you know, you're not, I mean, six figures every month, net. That's cool, you know. We want more, obviously. We want to compete, to go more. But um, why? It's just we get it started in the right timing, right? Not a lot of people was paying attention to the insurance, right? During a lot the Great of people, Recession, correct. Right. Yeah, a yeah. lot of people go into other things, and uh, it, it's, it's a better strategy to get involved in the industry at the right timing. We get involved in a, in a right time with the right company too, mm -hmm. like the right company, mm -hmm. company that is growing, company that is trendy, that understand technology. It's not the typical, there is a lot of companies out there in our industry, it's just the same old thing. It's no, uh, there is nothing else, it's just the same message, the same message that they always say, if you come over here, we're gonna pay you more. That's it, that's it. There's no innovation, there is no vision, there is no heart, there is no, it's just a regular thing, you know. Why the people and Apple, why Apple kill everybody, all the, all the computer, why, why? Because their vision was totally different. Their business was not just to create a new phone, a new computer, their vision was to change the world. Why does a company like, I can name it, like, why Amazon <laughs> is killing it? Why? Because they got in the right timing, they got a good leader, they got somebody who think big. The same with us, it's, it's like, we, okay, strategies, right timing, right company, right mentorship, right industry, where a lot of people were just focusing in the same old things. I'm gonna go and do what everybody's telling me to do. Just either go to school, graduate and get a degree and just get a regular job and work over there for 40 years. Or maybe just, I'm gonna go what my, my, my uncle Johnny told me. He told me, do work, work with it. If, I, if I'm insurance, right? If that company offer you this, or the, some companies, if that offer you benefits, go with that company, offer you benefits. So the old school. Like, we just took the opportunity, I, I think so, right strategy, right mentor, right vision, the, and, and uh, you work hard, you're gonna make it. That's what I would tell somebody that is listening right now. I mean, uh, insurance industry is the right time to do it, right moment. That's what I would tell them. George, you know, from somebody that you know, if, as you can see and unpack that uh, as well, you know, somebody's uh, suffering through loss, people that may have been uh, like us where they're unaffected by the pandemic and they're suffering a furlough, they're suffering a layoff, they just ran out of stimulus checks, they just ran out of unemployment checks, they're suffering a loss right now, and the last thing they're probably thinking about is, you know, is starting a business. But in your life, both of your lives, the gift of entrepreneurship, the vehicle of business has saved your lives and you've affected tens of thousands of lives in the meantime. So what would somebody be doing right now if they take the setback and they can process it one of two ways? It's either, man, life sucks or, as Rodolfo said, it can be an opportunity because you both are co-founders of PHP Agency, official co-founders of PHP Agency. The last thing somebody thinks, is thinking about right now is getting better. They're getting bitter, but how would you advise them to get better and embrace this failure or setback of their love to potentially start something that five, 10 years from now, they're first generation cash flow millionaire themselves. You know, there's a, there's a, a young, there's a young guy in our company. He's not an agent. He's somebody's son. His name is Jojo. And he's uh, one of our marketing director, uh, Laura, who's under, uh, uh, she works with Paulette and Sia in mm. Santa Clarita, California. Um, his dad passed, uh, mm. years ago. And the other day we go, um, we reach out once a year, we do a lunch or a dinner or something. And uh, I go meet with him and he ends up showing me a video of when he was 11 years old. It's out of uh, one of our overviews. And he's there wearing a suit, all suited up, 11 years old. Nice. And I said, what do you want to do when you get older, young man? You know, and he says, and I just want to help people. I want to be a businessman because I want to help people. You know, and it's like his mindset was framed of, I want to be a businessman because he saw his mom and dad's business people. And it's like, sometimes when you believe in what you believe, like, well, we believe this, why? Because that's who we are, because these people help the poor. We believe this because of this, or we're Christian because of this, or we believe this because of this. Like, most of us don't really know what we believe in life. We copy somebody else's belief. We 
copy somebody else's personality. We copy somebody else. And you kind of have to copy when you're little because you got to learn how to do stuff. But at one point, what's unique about you is you put all those pieces together to really create a unique um, individual. And so I'm sitting with him, and his dad's in the background of the video, man. And he's so proud looking at his son, like, smiling. And it was such a beautiful video. And we were having lunch, and he's going through his challenges, teenager, 16, going through life. We all go through it, you know, mm -hmm. questioning, upset, frustrated, this whole COVID situation, the way that they're doing school. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, sometimes in darkness, you know, there's light. And in light, that there's also darkness. And so you've been through some rough moments in your life. And I talk about the yin-yang uh, symbol, you know, and the whole reason for it is that there's good and bad, but that's, that's, that's the energies of life. And sometimes we want to change the situation and we can't change the situation. We have to look at this situation and say, what is this telling me? What is God telling me? What is life telling me? You know, how do I take something that's negative and really turn it into something positive? Because every opportunity, right, every adversity has an opportunity in it. And, uh, and I tell him like in the darkest parts of your life, in that symbol, there's still a little bit of light. You know, why? Because there's always lightness. There's always opportunity in something that's bad. There's always light and dark. Um, and so I would just tell people, you know, and, uh, and now he's, he's, he's going through it and he's forming mm -hmm. and he's being, mm -hmm. he's being built right now. And I think moments like this that are hard build you more than the moments that are good, make you change more than you probably change when things are good, maybe force you to change where you wouldn't change when you were comfortable. And uh, I think there are opportunities to recreate yourself, but, but, but I also understand like if you're in a state of like, why is this happening to me? And man, I'm depressed, like that's gonna be your first state, but you can't stay in that state. You can't stay in that state long-term. It's not helping for right. you. You don't even like the way you feel about it in that <laughs> moment. So I would tell you like transition faster. Like, okay, this happened. What am I gonna do? What can I do? What can I control? What can I control? And, and, and let me go explore. And if they're watching this video on your channel or, or any of the channels today, um, you know, it's because you're looking, you're searching for something. And, and the biggest part is you got to get around people that are already there because this isn't just a video thing. This is a life thing. This is a last night, you know, one o'clock, you guys are doing cigars. We're doing over here. Then we're having all these different meetings. Sure. You got to get around a group of people to become your support team because none of us made it by ourselves. You know, this like tough guy, all, all of us help each other, challenge each other, leverage each other at one point. And I think that's what real strength is, is knowing that you need a brotherhood, knowing that you need a sisterhood, knowing that you have an environment like this. So. Find an environment of people that want to encourage you, want to get your back, will be tough on you, will love you, will challenge you, uh, because maybe this is an opportunity to change. Well, that being said, guys, the last place you want to be is isolated and alone, as these two gentlemen have alluded. It is about community. It's about competition within inside that community and having that camaraderie and teamwork help build you up to the next best version of you. So if you're watching this, I'd love to know your thoughts, your comments. Drop them in the comments section below. And before I let you go, make sure you watch this video, how you turn $500 into a $45 million business. Make sure you check out this video too as well, so therefore we can continue to unpack this conversation and create a little bit more tangible understandings about how you can do that too as well. Because if we can figure it out, I know you can too as well. So again, drop your thoughts and comments in the section below. If you haven't done so already, please click like. If you're watching this on Facebook, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notification, be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. With that being said, on behalf of George Palayo, make sure you follow him, his Instagram handle, YouTube is right here. Make sure you follow Rodolfo Vargas, make sure you follow his Instagram and YouTube channels here too as well. Like, follow, and subscribe to them as well. That being said, I'm your money smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.